Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, Nick Collistrom is my guest. Nick joins me to offer his insights and perspectives into the McCartney conspiracy. Nick wrote a book on the topic, The Life and Death of Paul McCartney, 1942 through 1966, A Very English Mystery, is available on Amazon and a terrific read. And so without further ado, here's the conversation with Nick. Well, folks, we have another great show. My guest is Nick Collistrom, and our topic today is uh, going to be the McCartney Conspiracy. Nick wrote a great book, The Life and Death of McCartney, a very English mystery, and uh, Nick has also written several other books, including The Dark Side of Isaac Newton, How Britain Initiated Both World Wars, Chronicles of False Flag Terror, and Breaking the Spell. But like I said, today it's going to be about the McCartney Conspiracy, or as many refer to it as Paul is Dead. So, Nick, it's really an honor to have you on the show, and I uh, want to thank you for, for reaching out. And I was wondering, before we get started and get into uh, your view of the conspiracy, if you can just fill us in on how you actually got into it, because that always intrigues people. Yeah, Mike. Well, uh, it's a thrill to be on your, on your show, Mike. Uh, I, I, and um, let, let me try to answer. I was never a big Beatles fan, you know, but I'd, I'd done sort of conspiracy-type books, and... Uh, uh, a friend of mine started telling me about this this whole thing, and he gave me a copy of the memoirs of Billy Shears. We, we, we got here volume two, uh, or the second edition of it, uh, and uh, he just uh, sort of dr- dropped it on on me, uh, and I started talking about it. I, I think I did a discussion program with Jim Fetzer, uh, uh, and uh, people started asking me if I was going to write a book about the subject. Uh, and uh, obviously, in, in my youth, I grew up with all this happening, like everyone else. And uh, so I just kind of tuned into it as a kind of fascinating. I, I, lo- I love the idea of a mystery that that we can't solve. You see, however hard we all try, and we do try hard, no one can actually fathom the identity of this new guy, the replacement for. Uh, and uh, so I think that fascinated me. Yeah. Okay. So you said you read memoirs, and what did you think of the book, Nick, when you first read it? Because uh, there are folks out there that claim the book is just uh, a bunch of fiction and it, it really shouldn't be paid attention to. But I disagree with that, as you know, because I know you are aware of my work. So what's your take on the book? Oh, I felt it was, uh, I mean, let's first consider the mystery that none of the Beatles wrote autobiographies. All the people closest to the Beatles, you know, the managers, um, uh, the, uh, the only one was Mel Evans. He tried to, and he got bumped off a week before it was published. Uh, but uh, basically, think of all the vast sum of money that could have been made by publishing, uh, by insiders publishing the Beatles story. I mean, you've got an, in 1964, I think it was, uh, a book about the Beatles by Bill Shepard. And, and we still don't know quite who that Bill Shepard was. But basically, it's only outsiders who wrote the biographies, which is incredibly strange. And uh, we've got the most successful musician the world has ever known. That is what a guy we call Fool. I mean, personally, I'm not that into listening to his music terribly, but I've got to admit, he's, you know, a brilliant performer and enormously successful. And uh, why hasn't, you might, let's ask, why hasn't he written his autobiography? Well, I would say the Memoirs of Billy Shears was it, right? That is it. And he comes out, emerges from, through a glass plate, as it were, uh, 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 into into history in uh, basically October, November 66, and nobody can see back before then, really, can you? Uh, I mean, you've got one or two awful-sounding albums, Billy Pepper and the Pepperpots, uh, which really sound bad, excruciating, uh, and he sort of claims that was him. Well, um, there are no pictures of this of the guys in this in this uh, uh, in, in in the album, uh, and. Uh, I mean, it might be. Let's accept he was a session musician, but he comes out of nowhere, and he, he as he says in one of his songs, he was to, there to mend the broken band, and and uh, he does that, and he tells the whole story. He, he he wants to tell it, but his lawyer advises him, it's got to be deniable. It's got to have fictional elements in it, right? Right. Uh, it, it's got to have bits in it that you can say in a court of law are untrue. Well, I would say his his take on Vivian Stanshaw, the Bonzo Dog Band, uh, that that has to be deliberately untrue. He, he claims that he made up the identity of Viv Stanshaw. Now, it's quite complicated. 
uh, if you want me to go into it, uh, in the Magical Mystery Tour at the end, there's this guy singing, ostensibly the, the Bonzo Dog Band, Death Cab for Cutie, right? Right. And I remember uh, at this time, Lennon sang, there's only about 100 people who understand our music and people wondering what is the big mystery. Well, I would say, that, uh, and, and also, the Magical Mystery Tour is the first big flop that the Beatles do. Uh, the critics, none of them get what it's supposed to be about. Well, actually, it's showcasing the new guy. It's all about four, right? This big fellow with big green eyes who doesn't look very much like the old Paul. Uh, and it's an act of enchantment with John Lennon saying, you know, nothing is real. Uh, whereby we, the public, come to accept this new guy as Paul. And at the end, the last song, Death Cab for Cutie, you see this, uh, he's a sort of blonde looking fellow, isn't he? Um, I suppose we're Viv Stanshall, and that is Paul. That is Paul dressed up as Viv Stanshall with blue eyes. I think blue, blue, green eyes, fairly blue eyes, okay? Uh, uh, and, uh, I think that's a key element of, um, of what the Magical Mystery Tour was about. And, uh, but Viv Stanshall was a real British eccentric character. He used to appear regularly on radio shows, uh, John Peel radio show. So he was a real character. So I'm getting a bit uh, long-winded, but I- I'm trying to show that not everything in that book is true. Okay. I think that bit about Viv Stanshall has to be made up because there was a real character. He was a total British eccentric, not at all like Paul. Um, uh, and uh, I looked in the, there is a biography of him. He's fairly ginger haired and he's got brown eyes. He's quite a heavily melancholic character. So uh, the, the, the Monza Dog Band did have this real guy with potential, but maybe they did play about a bit with identities, which uh, I wouldn't generally recommend to do. Uh, and Fall did impersonate him in that Magical Mystery Tour. So that is, to try and answer your question, that is the one bit I think is untrue, or that I noticed was untrue. In, in, in that memoirs of Billy Shears. And, uh, there's quite heavy numbers of mysticism in that book. It came out on 9909. And it's got 66 pages, 666 pages with 66 chapters. Uh, and that date, 9909, was, uh, it came out in America. And in Britain, on that same date, a complete remastering of all the Beatles, uh, songs were published, weren't they? A uh, batch of CDs. Right, that's right. Uh, so he's obviously synchronising with the highest level of people uh, in the Beatles sort of kingdom, uh, Neil Aspinall, uh, to, to, to do it all. Uh, so he's obviously got permission, and the guy who puts it together, compiles it, Thomas E. U. U. Harriet, thanks Paul McCartney, thanks Sir Paul McCartney, uh, for providing marvellous material in a way that he couldn't possibly do if if Paul wasn't the actual author of it. Um, so um, Thomas U. Harriet has wrapped up the text a bit, but basically this is Paul um, trying to tell you what it's like to, to move in uh, and, and the totally brilliant, awesome event that happened in 1967, the Summer of Love and Peace, as all sorts of bands around the Beatles came to appreciate this amazing transformation had taken place and the unbelievable fact that in some respects the newcomer was better than the old guy, or at least more complicated and mature songs were being produced, you know? Yeah, so uh, with the Stanshall bit, so what you're saying is that uh, he, Billy, played a version of Vivian Stanshall, but he didn't necessarily create the character. You believe the character was already there, and Billy just... Totally, yeah. A guy lived in Muswell Hill, East, East London, and it actually burnt down his flat, uh, died tragically, uh, and and he was um, uh, sort of larking about as a British eccentric, uh, and he, and so he had various things things he did, shows he did, and and I, I think that band w- w- was something that he was involved in. Yeah. Now, Nick, memoirs has what I consider to have a dark thread running through it, and the conspiracy. It's not as simple as a car crash, and then they found somebody to replace him, and the topical story goes like this. They replaced him because if they didn't, the youth would have been crushed, that this, this idol, this entertainer, right, yeah. was gone. And uh, so we get a very different view of this as we read memoirs. It, it, it certainly appears to me that this replacement of Paul McCartney was in the pipeline for a long time, that Billy was on standby. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, my book 
presents the simplistic view of what, what you just said. He dies tragically in a car crash. Brian Epstein has to move very quickly, find the new replacement, get him in, stop the newspaper reports coming out. Uh, and um, John Lennon agrees to try and pull the band together and keep going. The father of, uh, of Paul, Paul's father, is then consulted. Will he go along with it? Will he accept Paul as the surrogate son? And he says yes. And because the family agrees... They, they can go ahead with it. Now, that is kind of the official story, which all works on one level, right? Right. But, as you point out, in this 21st century, we're very aware of the date 9-11. It keeps uh, ha- haunting us, right? And th- that keeps thrumming through the Beatles story, 9-11. Uh, and uh, so, don't know them, it is, obviously, it, well, it appears for, for PRD buffs, you, you'll see on the drum skin of Sergeant Pepper, you get he die, nine eleven, or eleven nine, depending which way you read it, right? Right. Uh, uh, no, sorry, depending on whether it's American or British dating. So uh, the whole Paul is dead thing broke in Detroit in sixty nine, and they took the date therefore the replacement as November the ninth. That that was kind of the way they saw it, and, and you see a lot of PID books have have that date, and that was actually the date when. Lennon met uh, Yoko Ono, I think, <laughs> at this um, uh, at this art gallery place. Um, rather, rather, it's a terrible moment for him, in a way. Uh, but uh, the most likely date for Paul dying, I think, is September the 11th. And um, I think he, he comes back from the American tour. He really does an interview with Melody Maker. Valentine, Penny Valentine, does, it, I think, totally authentic interviews, the real Paul there. And... And he's just in the brilliant peak of his career. Let's say this is Paul's birthday today. In my opinion, no young man has ever achieved so much in four and twenty years. You know, I think we should honour the amazing achievement which uh, which he had been through. Beatlemania. He brought the band together, and he, and he was like, he was like sort of too good and too beautiful and too rich to live. So he became a, like the perfect sacrifice. And then after September eleventh. You get the Melody Maker Awards ceremony. That was in a place in the middle of London called the Post Office Tower, which had just gone up, very classy place. Uh, and I found no newspaper reports uh, indicating that anyone had really been there. The, the guys who got the prize, like Tom Jones, he knocked Cliff Richard off his perch as number one as a singer, and he was dead chuffed. But the reporter just went round to where Tom Jones worked. You know, there was no suggestion that, uh, of, of anyone. Uh, and, and the only reports that came from this post office tower were obviously kind of fixed up and rather silly stories. Uh, now, on, on the web, there are some quite good pictures, somebody looking a bit like Paul and somebody looking a bit like Ringo being given the award. Uh, and uh, I might quote what he says in, in the memoirs that he shares. He says that was one of our very best doubles that Paul used for that event. So that is a big decision for PID. Is, do you agree that he's not really there on the 13th at that awards ceremony. I would say the catastrophe has then happened. Uh, that's a kind of post-apocalypse moment, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and that strongly endorses the 9-11 moment. And, and 9-11 keeps echoing. The very first song they, they recorded in, in the studio made available was on September 11th. Then the year after his death, the Magical Mystery Tour begins in the morning of September the 11th. And then I think there's a, a song that Lenin composes, is it Glass Onion, where he's trying to reminisce about or contact Paul, September the 11th. And then I think the, um, you know, the big Crowleyite, um, the Wing Beetle. You remember that? Yes, of course. Uh, yep. That, uh, hang on, I'll just show. Are, 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 we, are we on video here? We are, right. Okay, now look at this. Is, this is so mysterious. This is the poem by Alistair Crowley. Right. This is a book of poetry published in 1910, right? And notice, if you, if you, now all PRD buffs, you, you, you've got to watch that Wing Beetle thing. It's about an hour long. And it's a whole lot of very mysterious, quite esoteric stuff about who this, how the replacement was done, who he is. You'll notice it has got that winged, exactly the same motif there, the Wing Beetle, right? And it doesn't say... It's actually a copy from that poem, the front piece of Crowley poetry. It doesn't say that. So, so that wing beetle comes out on 9/11, 2010. Uh, so, 
uh, th- th- there is a, there is a strange 9-11 theme that, that, that haunts this Beatles story and, and that indicates some deep planning. That, 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 uh, that, 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 that there's got to be some planning and, and uh, we don't understand this. I mean, the date was near to the autumn equinox new moon um, and about certain ceremonies connected with that. Um, so if you want to say that was a kind of predestined date, um, I'm told that Paul was having dreams of his own demise. Yeah, an American lady that told me yeah, she's got, a, but I haven't, I haven't seen that. I, I couldn't confirm that from my book, but that is one of the stories that before he died, he started having frightening dreams that he wasn't going to be around for much longer. Well, that's that's spelled out actually in memoirs where they talk about the dreams and he was having these uh, these recurring nightmares. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Memoirs claims it, right? Yeah. But in terms of having evidence from Paul himself, the question is, can we believe the memoirs? Uh, can we believe the memoirs? Um, I, I'm told there is some sort of teen magazine which talks about the nightmare dreams Paul was having. Uh, that, that, uh, the question, question is, uh, how much can we trust this? And um, why the hell would he want to bring out a second edition? This is nine years later. This is 18909. And it's again, 666 pages, 666 chapters. Why would he want to do another edition? Um, I would say the second edition has more more emphasis on his Crowleyite philosophy. It does. However you want to see him, uh, who do you think he is? In, in a sense, you could say he's always asking that question that when he looks at you. Who, who do you think I am? Is the mystery man. And in a sense, you could say he's the, a magician. The, 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 someone who, uh, uh, in interviews, he expresses his philosophy of uh, somehow using magic, but not, I feel, in any evil or uh, unpleasant way, uh, for my say so. I, I would say his his vision of why magic works is a way of bringing together, uh, bringing people together, and trying to make people happy, make people happy, you know. Yeah, no, he comes across in the blue book, Nick. In my opinion, uh, less arrogant than he did in the red book, because in the red book and in the blue book, he was telling us that he wants us to get to know him. The problem is that you know the way he presented himself uh, through Tom in the red book wasn't exactly you, know, you didn't want to embrace the guy and hug him. So I noticed that the uh, his approach was uh, more affable in the blue book. That's just something that I noted and a few other people that I know that, you know, run in these circles has said the same thing. Now, you talked about 9-11, which is interesting because, yeah, the Beatles are immersed in uh, in the occult and uh, with uh, numbers or numerology. And in fact, on 9-11, 2001, Billy tells a story that he was in an airplane on the tarmac watching the whole thing take place on 9-11. Fantastic. Wow. Is okay. that in the book? Is that in yeah. the book? It's in the blue book. It's a, it's a quick mention. But uh, but it's not only in the blue book. He's mentioned this on a couple of interviews where he explains that he was there. And that's why he wound up doing the concert for New York. He, he said that that was the catalyst for him to pull it together and pull that concert together after the 9-11 event. He's a very interesting character. You know, you mentioned... Um, but he claims to be a sort of top Illuminati. Whoever you think the Illuminati are, he claims to be part, part of it and a top-level Mason. Uh, and, and he kind of defends that what the Illuminati are doing, doesn't he? Yes. And, and that's one of the things in the book that I think is, is worth the price of the book alone is uh, he explains how what I refer to as the Pyramid of Power works. The first 33... Degrees are the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Then we have 13 degrees of the Illuminati. And then he explains there are 20 degrees above that of people that and beings we will never know of. Uh And he definitely alludes to the fact that he resides in that middle tier, that he is in the Illuminati degrees, what I refer to as the illuminated degrees, that he's no longer in the, the, the Masonic degrees. He's surpassed the 33rd degree. And, of course, um, it's my opinion that this is because of all the work that he's done on behalf of the uh, of the agenda. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, he, 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 t- he, t- he totally does. I mean, he supports, you know, uh, 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 Obama and, and the main establishment, just like the modern Bob Dylan is, whoever he does, whoever he is. They are supporting the establishment. Um, 
uh, and uh, yeah, he he does claim claim to be part part of of that. Um, and in a way, this is a terrific contrast with the other Beatles. George and John were both terrified of dying. You see, all all, all the love after the Paul is dead after the incident with their beloved Paul leaving, they were both petrified of dying, and and John was haunted by it. Uh, and uh, that came out in a song, um, a song he he released shortly before he he, he was he was killed about uh, he's trying so hard to stay alive uh, and a kind of premonition that something's going to happen to him. And uh, George, a guy who never harmed a fly in his life, you know, he had his huge house like Fort Knox with all sorts of defences all around it to, to protect him. And, and what was all that for? And none of it worked, did it? Um, whereas uh, Fall is the absolute opposite. He knows that he cannot fall. It's, 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 he cannot fall down. Uh, uh, he knows there's always a protective net waiting for him to look after him. And in a sense, that's why he did that ridiculous thing in Japan. It, it, you know he's with wings. He's touring with wings. Uh, and he's going through Japanese customs and they open it up and they see a huge bag of dope in his bag. And Danny Lane is absolutely furious because he was in Wings and they lose the whole concert tour, right? Right. So Danny Lane loses a large amount of money and uh, and wonders why the hell is, is Phil playing at? Well, what was he playing at? Uh, well, at one level, I would say he was just trying to find out that uh, what was going to happen. How, how, he, how would he be rescued? He knew he would be rescued. And finally, a British intelligence guy has to come around to Japan and, and, and talk to the top people there. Uh, the the, the Jap- Japanese could tell from a fingerprints they had of Paul, the real Paul, I think from Germany, that this guy wasn't the real Paul. And they started making a big fuss. Who are you? Uh, and uh, he eventually got rescued by some uh, high up British, British intelligence guy who went over to Japan. So I would say that's an example of, of Paul knowing that He's always going to be safe. Uh, and and uh, so he kind of uh, can't, can't be destroyed, put it that way. You know, whenever uh, when he's, he's going through something that would uh, ter- terrify other people, he knows he's going to be rescued. Uh, and uh, that is uh, strangely part of his fate. The Beatles story involves a lot of people dying. Um, a lot of people... In order to keep the secret, the secret had to be kept, and anyone in danger of danger of speaking out, you know, um, like Jane Asher's father, uh, get, gets bumped off. Um, and and uh, for, for knows that one that he, he's okay. Yeah, he's what I refer to as a an untouchable. Untouchable, totally. Yeah, he's, that's a good phrase. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously he, he goes around the globe and. He, he can't stop singing and touring. I mean, it is very extraordinary. In, in his advanced years, must be in his mid-70s now, he can still do big two-hour concerts. Well, he's going to be 82 this year. 82. Fantastic. 82. And I just I, I saw him in concert here in uh, in the States, Nick. His voice is shot, but uh, I did a concert review uh, about a week ago or so. I, but I said that his mobility is unbelievable for a man his age. His stamina. So he's doing two and a half hour shows, 39 tour dates within a one year period of time. Now, I don't know how many people at that age can do that. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Just to tell our listeners where we get this age from, uh, I would say it's from in the Magical Mystery Tour. He talks to a lady about, um, I think it's from his jersey or sweater he's wearing. And he says, he says he's, he's 30, doesn't he? Yeah. I think that's what you, that's the basis for your calculation, isn't it? Well, that and, uh, yes, uh, in Magical Mystery Tour, he gives us a clue about his age and also in memoirs, he states that he's five years older than biological Paul. Yeah, that, that, that confirms it, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so somehow they could get away with having a five year old, a guy five years older. I and mean, it's amazing that they could do that and that they knew they could do that. Uh, I, I think that, uh, this is, um, we live in an age when this might happen to quite a few celebs, and it's partly that um, the intelligence agencies want to 
uh, explore their control over us uh, and controlling people's identity. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if they replace somebody, they've got a firm hold on your identity of who you are. Uh, and uh, I think that is part of the plan. That possibly the, the Bob Dylan, there was a fiery young anti-war activist, um, and his first first album showed a guy with hazel brown eyes and uh, quite a round face, a round chin. Uh, and then uh, he has a terrible accident, much the same time as Paul, uh, as Paul has his car accident. And then for several years, Dylan isn't visible. He does studio albums, rather like the Beatles doing studio albums. So for three, several years after Paul dies, the Beatles, because obviously they never send, like, sell another concert ticket. That's the last concert they ever sell, that American tour. And then they make studio albums. You never see them together again. So it's a terrifically dramatic change. And my impression is that, that Dylan goes through something similar. That for several years, he, he isn't really seen out. And then when he does appear, he's got dark glasses on a lot of the time, hasn't he? Yeah, Dylan is very perplexing too. Now, I haven't gotten into it to any great degree, Nick, but I, I've taken a look at Dylan in the very early years, going back into the early 1960s. And then you take a look at him later on, the mid to later 60s, and I have a hard time looking at those two views of him and concluding they are the same person. Yeah, he's got a br br bright, bright blue eyes uh, in, in the 21st century. Um, uh, has he not? Has he not? And my, my favourite line of Dylan is when he's singing, I came in from the wilderness, a creature void of form. Uh, and I feel that's, a, uh, that's an image of someone who's brought in as a replacement to be given an identity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the thing with, uh, with, uh, Billy out in Japan, again, the numbers, right? He spent nine days in jail in Japan. So the number nine pops up again. Now, Nick, you mentioned the intelligence agency. So let me, let me get your input on this. How long do you believe the Beatles were in the Tavistock pipeline? How long do you think that they were on their radar? Was it from the very beginning or do you think at some point Tavistock commandeered them? Well, I think uh, I think that the, that the intelligence agencies want to uh, ha have a control over popular music, part of their their their, their aim. Uh, I would have thought at some point there needs to be a real genuine rock band in Liverpool where the four lads are getting together, and and then they go off to Hamburg, and they really are who they appear to be. Uh, well, there aren't just four of them. There's, there's, there's more. This is before they're fully formed. Well, they've got Ringo Starr uh, and... and uh, Stuart Sutcliffe. Yeah, the, those are young men having a great time. They're, they're not famous. They don't hit the big time. They're, they're, they cannot be famous. Um, they, they just do concerts and they bang away in the, uh, in, in the Liverpool cavern. Um, th th that is a genuine band. And th then, they, then they come to London... They get, they get signed up. They get the, uh, um, they, they get, they get Ringo and, and uh, they get Epstein. So they've got two, you know, Jewish characters involved. Uh, and, and they, they then become uh, big and they're scheduled to be big. Uh, and I think from that point on, they are, um, whatever you think the Tubbs Dock is doing, uh, it, it's doing it then. Uh, and, and there's a weird connection here with Richard Asher, the father of Jane Asher, the lovely diva who Paul falls in love with. Uh, I, I, I would have, that seems to me like real love. I'm, I'm, I'm being na naive. I think those two were the rock royalty. They cruised around town, and she really was, you know, she was a, like Shakespearean actress, Doctor Who actress, and um, that they really did fascinate each other. Uh, and then. Um, after after Paul dies, uh, th then uh, then Jane goes through this trauma. She's not allowed to grieve, you see. Uh, and her father is then allegedly commits suicide in the basement of his flat. Uh, and and he was a top hypnotist, uh, hypnotist psychiatrist. So he would have been. This is quite near where the, physically near where the Tavistock Clinic is uh, in, in Hampstead, uh, and 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 uh, he he would have been closely connected with the Tavistock Clinic. And uh, the reason, I would say the reason why it's bumped off was because Paul gave his daughter, 
gave Jane an engagement ring, okay? A lovely Jane. I said, oh, Pep, said, oh, wow, oh, when's it going to happen? When's the big day? And then, ba dum ba dum ba dum he suddenly falls for Linda, the, the uh, New York photographer lady, who is far more his type, right? Well, obviously she is. You know, she's been photographing Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. She loves smoking dope. This is, this is, this is all the kind of um, woman that Fall really needs and really likes. So, so he falls for Linda. And I would say again, that, that is true love. That, that is a real relationship. Uh, and Jane is left out in the cold. She's totally pulverised. She went along with the game, the charade. She was told to. She had to. She went along with it. And then she's kind of emotionally paralysed. And I was at that point, her father was absolutely shocked and outraged and seeing the ruin of her daughter's, his daughter's life. And uh, that was the point at which, you know, he gets done in. And the terrible, that's a terrible moment when this genius top British psychiatrist, <sighs> um, and it's terrible to even think of that, but um, so, so he would have known everything that was going on, this fellow Richard Usher, obviously, and would have been part of it, maybe, maybe helping to program his daughter to go along with it, I don't know. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask you. Do you believe that the, the Ashers uh, were part of the program to essentially bring biological Paul McCartney into the equation and there is some level of mind control going on. Also, I might want to add to add to your to what you explained here, Nick, is that uh, Jane Ash's mother was George Martin's music teacher. That's yeah, another very got, yeah. interesting little piece to this. Do you think that the Ashers the Ashers had some role in um, in bringing biological Paul McCartney along some mind control program? Well, I don't know. They were a brilliantly talented family, and it all happening in in. in uh, in their house, and Jane uh, had, had a brother also living there, Ginger Hair brother, who, who uh, Paul wrote some songs for, for his band. Uh, uh, so it was a kind of big, happy family. Um, uh, to, to, uh, well, stuff like, you know, Ellen Rigby was, was written there in that basement where, where her father is, is, then dies. Uh, I, 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 I can't say about programming. I mean, I okay. just don't know enough about him. But he, he mysteriously gets premonitions, like like some Orpheus figure that he's got to leave this world, that he's going to die. And uh, he then moves, he then gets a very posh home, moves out from that home into uh, this St. Johnswood place, which is very posh. And he's just in the process of moving in with Jane there um, in, in the last year of his life. And that obviously is what? Fall then takes over. Yeah, because another song that came to Biological Paul in a dream, right? This is actually well documented. Was yesterday? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of an interesting way to get a get a song, I think. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wakes up with a song and he goes around singing, playing this song to people, and then he's in, I think, in, in Spain, isn't he, with with Jane, some location. Uh, uh, so somewhere in Spain, and and he then gets the music and, and the words. Yeah. So so that, that that is quite remarkable. Yeah. I mean, Fall's account of the liaison between him and Paul does involve some psychic interaction, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, as if Paul is somehow tuning into him with songs like "Hey Jude," which is so brilliant. Those people say to me, "You know, this must be the real Paul. Don't tell me it can't be anyone else." Uh, and Fall claims that it's. He's kind of inspired by Paul uh, to tell him to fully accept life as a Beatle. So, so the, the, there are indications of kind of uh, some sort of psychic interaction g going on here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because Billy does claim there is a, a spiritual connection between him and Paul, and uh, and you're right. I mean, he, he makes that, that statement that he's able to stay connected to him, and so therefore that's how he's able to play the part so effectively. Now, Nick, you mentioned the um, Jane Asher and, and Linda. Did you want to talk a little bit more about the women in Billy's life? And, and well, Paul's it is life? incredibly strange the way the women are so silent. And um, we start off with Dot, Dorothy, who's his girlfriend in Liverpool. And she goes over to Hamburg with him, you know, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and um, we'd love to hear it. She then disappears, goes off to Canada. We don't hear a word from her ever. And when Paul gets famous, comes out of London, she just disappears. Uh, and, uh, 
Then we get Jane, who will not say a word about Paul. Any interviewer goes round to her. She makes cakes and stuff now. She won't say a word about him. Uh, and she's totally emotionally paralysed. She's written various women's books, which um, are kind of extremely depressing, but, but passionate from a woman's point of view. They're passionate and kind of no-hope books, like uh, Will He Come Back or The, the Traumas that, that Keep... Uh, she, she associates with places. So she's got deep, buried trauma. Uh, I, I would have thought somebody could have tried to get through to her a bit better, but nobody seems to be able to. And she's married to this uh, Gerald Scarf, who's a bitterly cynical cartoonist. You know, he's painted bit right. You can't imagine anyone more opposite than Paul, uh, this, this totally cynical guy, Gerald Scarf. Um, it does bitter cartoons. So, so Jane really never says a word to anyone. Um, she won't talk about the good old days as we'd like her to, you know. And then Linda, what, 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 what did she say? Uh, again, she was very silent. I, I, I got one or two accounts of people going around to see her. I'm trying to remember what, what for, for a, do a hair or something like that. And she was saying, Oh, I'm not allowed out. I'm not allowed to talk. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you, you heard any accounts here, but I, I, I will say again, she's very silent about all the years of being in the band in Wings, all the experiences. We'd love to hear, hear her side of things. As if she was just instructed by Paul, keep quiet. That's just my impression, you know? Yeah, it's interesting with uh, with Linda. She really didn't talk a lot about the relationship outside of being in the band she kind of just towed the company line. Yeah. That's how I saw it. Now, in your book, The Life and Death of Paul McCartney, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned that when he met Linda, she said something to the effect, I know who you are and yeah. I know who you are not. Yeah, I, I think that was, that was the deal. Well, she was she was determined to grab the last remaining beetle, um, uh, totally focused on doing this, and her, her deal was that she wanted to be in the, be in a band with him uh, and uh, and get married to him. Now, she had no musical talent, just like Yoko Ono, I would say. Uh, and and uh, she, she, she was exactly what Paul needed because he could talk about the problem pretending to be Paul with her. So she, she had got photographs. She was a photographer. She got photographs of the Beatles and she could see this guy was different. So she knew this guy, Fall, was some kind of mysterious character who wasn't the original Beatle. And, and uh, uh, th that was, I think, very much what attracted him towards her, apart from her being, you know, very good looking. Um, so she was exactly what he most needed, really. Uh, that's a way of getting away from the Beatles' identity. That's around 6970. That's what he really wanted. He closed down the Beatles. He wanted to start a new life. And she was just the thing for him because uh, he didn't have to pretend anymore at being a Beatle. Uh, and uh, th they made a couple of albums up in Scotland. Um, I think it was just the two of them, really. Uh, and, uh, I, I mean... I would say it's a very unremarkable voice he's got when he finally comes out of the, the, the magic studio, the Beatles studio, and just singing by himself. Um, I would say the voice you hear on those couple of albums isn't terribly interesting. Uh, let's just come back to the amazing picture you just put out of, of, of Linda. I'm, I'm rather haunted by the way the women keep silent. Uh, you got a picture of Linda with this guy having six toes. And Linda seems perfectly happy. She's just beaming, you know. Uh, so what the hell is going on here? Um, but, but, but before we come on to this, I want to talk about another lady, a maternal lady, who Paul really enjoyed. When it, in, in his Liverpool days, there was the Caldwell household. There was Rory Storm, Alan Caldwell, uh, and um, Mrs. Caldwell. Uh, and uh, often after concerts, he'd just go over to their home, the Caldwells, and he'd spend all night just chatting with with this old, this lady, who's, cause his mother was dead, you know, uh, and, uh, they were a really happy household, and, uh, they could just talk about everything, you know, uh, and Rory Storm went, Rory Storm and Hurricanes 
went to Hamburg with the Beatles, right? Uh, okay, so those suddenly end up dead, right? Uh, Rory Storm, uh, Caldwell, and his mother. Oh, they just commit suicide. I fancy that. Um, 1972. Um, so this is this would have been a signal to everybody in Liverpool who knew the Beatles: keep your mouth shut. You know, uh, I, I, and uh, but at the same time, it's another. It, it's a lady who we would really like to have heard from. We'd really want to hear her whole angle on the story. Uh, what, what was it like? What did you chat about? You know, how come is Dorothy's girlfriend suddenly vanishes? Uh, and and uh, we don't, we don't. They're gone, right? Yeah. Well, wasn't it? Wasn't it together? Uh, they're both alleged to have committed suicide, aren't they? Yeah, I, I don't know if it was together. I thought that she passed away after him, but in either case, it was one, two. Right. Both of them yeah, were out. Yeah, one, two. Yeah, with pills, with pills. And Ringo played for Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. That's right. Yeah, he used to be in that group. Yeah, they pulled him out. Right. Uh, then, then Heather Mills. Uh, okay. Uh, what was it that so shocked Heather Mills? She says, um, I, I can't tell you. It's something terrible. And then the bewildered interview is asking him, trying to find out what is so terrible. And he says, was it infidelity? And she says, no, nothing like that. No, it's far worse. Uh, and, uh, and then she has mysterious comments like, he's got a machine behind him. There is this, uh, there, there is this, uh, Paul McCartney, but there's a machine behind him. Um, and I, I think what you're coming out with, with this five toes business, uh, I, I think that uh, what, what shocked her wasn't just something that happened 50 years ago. I don't think it was just Paul, Paul, Paul saying to her, you know, listen, darling, 50 years ago, I wasn't quite the man you think I was. Um, I don't think that would have horrified her. Um, I think it's something much closer to home, sort of maybe in the bedroom. And um, some people say there are two different fools, one with green eyes and one with blue eyes, uh, that you can tell the difference between them. So do you think Heather knew that he was not Paul McCartney? I get asked that question a lot. What are you? Oh, totally, on that? yeah, totally. She, she knew that, but that, that wouldn't have... Well, hang on, I'm just guessing. I'm assuming that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, let's assume that she did. But I don't think that would have horrified her. Now, I don't think that would have left her freaking out and saying, there's stuff I've got in a box. I can't possibly tell you, it's so awful. But it's in a box, if anyone tries to kill me. Um, that, that, that sort of stuff. Uh, there's, there's part of the frightening mystery uh, behind this character, whoever he is. Uh, and, and Heather saw something, maybe she wasn't supposed to see it. What do you think that might be? You said you mentioned something in the bedroom. You think it's something anatomically? Well, it might just be a duality. That There are two of them. Okay. It might be something like that. And, and that, that freaks her out. Uh, who, who is this guy, really? Um, and it's something she cannot tell. She gets 20 million to keep quiet. Uh, and she has kept quiet. I mean, obviously, we'd all like her story. She disappeared. Well, we don't hear much more of her, do we? No. 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 No, oh, right. And that's because there were confidentiality agreements signed. That's my guess. So they both signed on the dotted line and said they weren't going to talk about each other. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So uh, I've tried to show there's quite a few women who, who just vanish or go silent. Um, there's a couple of aunts. When Paul's growing up, there's a couple of nice aunts who are looking after him, uh, help help his dad. Auntie, what's the name? Um, they, they come round and, and help prepare meals and stuff when when, um, when Paul is growing up. Um, uh, and and uh, I don't know if I can find them. Uh, and and uh, they, again, they they rather suddenly die, disappear. That uh, we, we we would like to hear reports from from, from that. Auntie Jin and Aunt, Auntie Millie turn up in the evening helping to cook tea, uh, and. Uh, there's the whole question of DNA sampling that we'd all like to try and clarify a bit. Um, uh, the, 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 these are these are some sort of family family members. Uh, so uh, uh, the, these these aunts who saw Paul growing up, um, uh, and uh, for example, there's a guy who claims to be the brother of Paul uh, who goes around doing family memoirs. He looks very very dodgy. Mike, his brother Mike. Mike McCartney or Mike McGear, yeah. I mean, yeah, he doesn't look the least bit like the brother of Paul. No, um, not at all. Not at all, no, no. It's funny, you know, Nick, you mentioned Auntie Jin. That 
is a lyric in the song that uh, Billy wrote, Let Him In. He has people's names in the song, and he, he mentions Auntie Jen, so I found I find that interesting, yeah. Oh, yeah, right, okay. Anyway, th- they were part of Paul's childhood, uh, and uh, I-, I just got some brief mention of of them being having some uh, some condition under which they couldn't speak. You know, uh, I mean, these are... These are situations where you expect some journalist to go around and, and want to get their story, uh, and it doesn't happen. Uh, and uh, uh, if we wanted to get further on this fascinating enigma, I think if we could get any of these women to speak, that would be very crucial, you know. Yeah, I think it's going to be a very long shot. Obviously, as we've been talking here, is we mentioned before that he's an untouchable, So, and the machine behind him, is big and scary. Yeah, yeah. But he does say, he keeps saying, the second edition of Billy Shears, he's expected to pass away soon, there will be the question whether he allows his DNA to be sampled. I mean, the vast McCartney empire, now a multi-billion empire, uh, who does it go to? Uh, and that will be very crucial, won't it? Uh, that, that, uh, I mean, I've got, I've got a friend up in Liverpool who claims to be a, a son, a legitimate son of Paul McCartney. Whether he is or not, I don't know. But, uh, He's he's quite interested in in getting DNA samples, so th- there should be, you know, one or two legitimate kids of Paul, grown up now, um, who will be prepared to get together and have their DNA sampled, because uh, you know, Paul did once allow his blood to be sampled in Germany, didn't he? Yes, in the Bettina Huber's case. Yes, the fallacy is just to show that he wasn't the biological father of this. Uh, lady who was uh, uh, the son of the daughter of Paul, um, and, and uh, so I don't know if they have still got his his blood um, or his DNA sample, but uh, that would be a very live issue. And I, I think if we could in any way get samples from any of these people, um, relatives of Paul or Paul, or even say Mike McGear or something, you know, you just need one or two hairs from the head. Uh, that might be a real possibility of getting someone on this subject. Yeah, the only problem would be the ability to to have it happen. Uh, because even if somebody was able to get the DNA in a way, let's just say, that was not approved by the McCartney Enterprise, uh, the ability to complete those tests, publish those tests, and so on, would be squelched immediately and probably be very, very dangerous for the person that pursued the path. <laughs> oh, dear, right. Shucks. <laughs> right, yes, I think I can't disagree with that, yes. So, Nick, what do you think are the motives involved regarding Tavistock? Why did Tavistock do this? Was it just simply social engineering? Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm not sure they did do it. I, I mean, who bumped off the Kennedys? Who bumped off Lady Diana? Uh, these are people who are kind of the most admirable human beings, uh, and, and uh, everyone loves them, uh, and then they get bumped off in their prime. I mean, is there some prince? Is this a sacrifice? Was it a sacrifice? You, you, you know, is is that one of the levels or dreadful levels of of motivation that these thing this thing is inevitable and predestined as a sacrifice? Um, that these might be matters kind of beyond our comprehension. I say, my, my, my book just takes the very simplistic view of a, a terrible accident, which had to be, um, which had to be somehow, uh, the situation had to be rescued. But uh, there must have been some level of the thing being preordained. Uh, and uh, Fall does indicate that he's got an uncle who's high up in the Masons who who is kind of guiding this replacement principle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, with the farm, there's a farm up in Scotland that um, Paul seems to buy. As far as we can make it out, it's the real Paul who buys it, which is quite hard to believe. He's got no interest whatever in a farm in the middle of nowhere. Neither he nor Jane are the sort of people who would have enjoyed being out on this farm. Uh, and then Paul comes along. That was just, I think, May, months, months of his, before he died, he got this farm, didn't he? Yes. Uh, and then Fall comes along, and he makes the Mull of Kintyre out of it, you know. Uh, oh, this is his deep roots. I mean, he keeps telling us in the book he's got these deep Scottish Scottish roots uh, as Campbell, William Campbell. 
uh, and and him and Danny Lane go up there and they get some local bands and make Mull of Kintyre out of it, which is an amazing thing to do. And, and he's, he, Fool says he feels really at home up there somewhere, so I can't imagine why. This bleak island in the middle of nowhere, um, with just some sheep around. But, but, but he does that. And, 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 uh, so, so, so that, that is, um, as if he's got some, he, claiming to have some connection up in Scotland. So I'm not really answering very well your, your, your question about, uh, how, how the Tavistock might have, uh, planned this. Um, I mean, I looked, I looked for evidence of Tavistock involved in this kind of thing, you know, mind control and so forth, and I couldn't find it. Uh, so I couldn't find anything concrete to say about the Tavistock. So I didn't in, in my book. Oh, that's okay. But why, why do you think? Well, first, let me just say that the Mull of Kintyre is like the national anthem of Scotland now. So, <laughs> so Billy is talking about his roots, in my opinion. Um, yeah. But, but ah. the sacrifices and the rituals, oh, your words were sacrifice. So let's stick with that word. That would, uh, lend itself to the occult. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what is the purpose of the sacrifices then? If we don't, if we take, Tavistock out of the, the equation, and we just talk about the fact that the sacrifices are done. What would be the purpose of that? Let me try to give an answer, which is, in a way, your question is kind of too difficult to answer. Let me say, but, but um, think of the effect it had on the Beatles' music, and think of the mystery of death and rebirth, which is what we're talking about. I and mean, what you see on the front cover of Sgt. Pepper is kind of resurrection. It's a resurrection mystery. See so the old Beatles, grey waxwork Beatles, and one of them's dead. And that they're finished. They're the simple, uh, what, what, uh, what Fuller calls silly love songs. That was it. It's all over. And you get the new Beatles, the psychedelic, uh, and they've come back from the dead. A bit like the Rolling Stones Rocky On after Brian Jones has died, if I'm making the comparison. But both of these bands rock on after the death of their ma- main member. Uh, and, uh, the Beatles go through an awesome transformation. Uh, and, it was Sergeant Pepper, you've got four lonely people that they're no longer together. They don't wear the same gear, uh, uh, and they don't sing together at the same microphone. Uh, they're four lonely people, and all the songs about existential situations of individual people, right? They're not the four of them in this amazing heavenly blissful harmony. They're, they're locked out of heaven now. They can't get back to the heaven, that, that bliss they used to be able to do in the Beatles concerts, where they'd all sing together. That's gone forever. And, you've you got these four lonely characters, but some, but albums like uh, Abbey Road, I mean, isn't that probably the most popular Beatle album? Uh, and it's got much more mature themes in it, uh, that, that we've grown up now, uh, and, uh, it, 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 it's no longer the first sort of teenage love, um, I want to hold your hand, uh, and, uh, we've got much more much mature themes. Maybe the fate was that the old Paul couldn't have done that. That, that, that uh, this is something, uh, and it had a large effect on the various bands, uh, I, I would say, uh, Donovan, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones, uh, and, and Elton John, seeing this new guy, seeing this amazing transform, and it inspired them. So I think a lot of the sense of wonderment of the swing 60s isn't just taking drugs and LSD. Uh, I think for the British bands, it was this transformation of, of the Beatles. Uh, so, so the, um, the, the, the awesome classic, Sgt. Pepper, uh, was to some extent, well, it was composed by Fall, wasn't it? It was Fall and, um. It was his baby. Yeah, his, his baby. So, so uh, I, I think we should recognize the, the, the part of the mystery of this. It's a mystery, uh, and I, I like it because we can't fathom it. We can't answer the ultimate questions of how it happened and who arranged it. Um, but, but uh, it does give us this, uh, so it's quite a Shakespearean mystery, I would say, uh, of, of identity, and it gives us these, these the, the great uh, Beatle albums that uh, go beyond what they did in the old days when Paul was there. I'm going to ask you a question, Nick. I know the answer that you're going to give me, but I'm going to ask you because I get asked this question. How do you know, or are you absolutely convinced that the guy today is not the original Paul? Ha! <laughs> um, well, uh, for me, the, the key thing is the anguish and desolation that the Beatles, the three remaining Beatles went through in the latter half of 66, uh, 
once Paul had gone, uh, and especially John Lennon, he really is totally wrecked. Um, he's smashed to bits. Uh, he gets totally addicted to heroin. His, his wife sees him just a shadow of his former self. He's with Yoko Ono now. Or oh, she's a ghastly antithesis to the lovely music he used to make the call. Um, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that sense of, 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 of tragedy, uh, uh, sort of devastation, would have happened if, if Paul had just kind of retired somewhere. Um, if there had been an arrangement for him to retire... Uh, uh, I, I mean, so that is one level. Another level, simply, this guy is so much bigger. I mean, his shoes are much bigger, you know. His head is much bigger. Um, uh, and and uh, he's at least two inches taller. Um, right. Uh, and uh, his, uh, the, the, the early pool, look in the colour color films, I think, help. And LeBron, you see the big chocolate brown eyes. He used to drive his drive the girls crazy, um, chocolate brown eyes, okay? Uh, and and you, you can't just change them to the guy now who's got blue eyes. It, you know, you really can't do that. Um, so there is a physical change. This this new guy is much more intellectual, more complicated, uh, 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 but the one thing he isn't is adorable. The one thing he can't be is adorable, <laughs> you, you, you know? The, the, the old Paul would would get uh, yeah, a charm. You listen to him being interviewed and saying David Frost, uh, and uh, he gives us one line of replies that are that are humorous, witty, and charming. Uh, uh, okay, um, uh, and uh, the the, uh, the the screaming fans is because they've got this adorable character as the as the main singer, uh, and once he'd gone. Um, you, you, you just wouldn't get those screaming fans again. You know, you get somebody, you get people admiring artists, for artists. Um, uh, cause, so, so the new guy can't step in and be, be adorable in that way. Um, and uh, my impression is, tell me what you think of this, that the old Paul was not into magic. I, he was at this, I don't think he was into Crowley. Um, he was at this... Uh, uh, what was it called? The gallery, the uh, Indic gallery. He'd go around there, Indic gallery, uh, uh, and I think the people running that were a bit, uh, were a bit into um, the Crowleyite stuff. But uh, I, I don't think, as far as I can tell, Paul wasn't. I think if he was into it, he was probably on the periphery. He was. I I believe he was too young to really understand what all was going on underneath the hood. In other words, there were people planning and strategizing, and you know he was part of that uh, of that process. But there was a lot of stuff that was going on where he and the rest of the Beatles were being manipulated, yeah. uh, and, and and not aware of that, right? Whereas Billy clearly is an occultist. Yeah, he's into mysticism and he's very much versed in the esoteric. And I think he shared that with Lennon. I think him and John Lennon shared this. Crowley up thing. I mean, I'm, I haven't read the Crowley, but Book of the Law and, and stuff. Yeah. Um, but but not in a dark way. That they didn't do any sort of nasty sacrifice or anything. Uh, they weren't to that side of things. I would say. Um, but but uh, they were somehow into Crowley art magic, uh, and that is why, as far as I can tell, uh, Lennon made this dismissive comment about the Christian religion that was going to fade away. Uh, and not only made that, but he absolutely refused to withdraw what he said there. Right. Even when the, the whole America was screaming, uh, it meant the band could never ever go back to America. Uh, and Epstein kept telling him to apologise. He would not apologise. He would not retract. He was amazingly adamant about that. All he finally came out with was an apology. I apologise if I have upset people. Right. And, and that isn't the point at all. It's not. Would, would he retract what he said? No, he wouldn't. Uh, and and, and uh, so that that terrific conviction. My, my hunch is, the impression I got, that him and Paul were both into the Crowley art stuff, Book of the Law, you know, do what thou wilt, whatever. Um, and, 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 um, Paul is very much a kind of guiding principle in his life, isn't it? Uh, uh, and, uh, in, in the, the Winged Beetle, it kind of implies that Crowley is his father. I, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, um, 
Uh, it probably would have to have been in the 60s or something, um, if you actually want to believe that. Uh, and I think in this new edition of the book, he does he does come out with something like that, doesn't he? Well, he alludes to it. It's kind of a big puzzle. Billy likes to hand things out in a thousand-piece puzzles strewn all over the place and have us go figure it out. So in the blue book, he tells us that he was tutored by Crowley, you know, up through the age of 10. Now, that would make sense because Crowley died in 1947 and Billy was born in 1937, so there's the 10-year period of time. Right, yeah. In the Blue Book, he also mentions that uh, he was in a mind control program or his earliest childhood memories. Oh, does he? I noticed that. At three oh, years that's old. Good. Oh, right. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So he mentions that. So we have him in a mind control program. Just, just go over that a bit more detail. Like, right. what does he say about that? He says that... Uh, he was tutored by Crowley, mm -hmm. and then he mentions that his earliest childhood memory of being in a mind control program was around the age of three years old. Wow. Tom explains in the footnote, obviously via Billy, yeah. that the mind control program was designed to keep him very disciplined and very focused on success. Yeah. That he would keep going, break down any obstacle to get where he needed to be in life. So it certainly appears that Billy, because of his bloodline, his elite bloodlines, was destined for a position of influence and affluence somewhere. And I'm assuming, I'm going to say in the entertainment industry. I'm not going to say it was yeah. going to be the Beatles. Right. But an opportunity would arise, a key opportunity, and Billy would be in a position based upon his, his mind control and his training and all that stuff to be able to step in and fill that role. So it it talks about that in memoirs, which was actually quite stunning uh, that he would actually come out and, and tell us about that. But yeah, it says he was in a mind control program. Yeah, well, that's amazing. That's very interesting, right? Yeah. I read the first book, which I, I felt was generally kind of better written than this. Um, so a, a lot of the second book is a repeat, isn't it? Actually, no. The blue book has some repetition from the red book but billy comes out with a lot more detail in the blue book a lot more right and the reason for that is because he had contacted tom you harriet the author and uh, said to tom that he can release more information now basically he received a green light to be able to go into more detail right and so nine years later because it's all about the nines right according to memoirs the blue book spells out a lot more about all Kinds of stuff, including Stanshaw, Ackroyd, and all that. Well, we, we haven't really mentioned Ackroyd, but um, the, the, the one character who's alive who could talk about him, and definitely, is this guy, De Danny Lane. Sorry, that's yeah. not his real name. He was in the book, The Band of Diplomats. Uh, and I think there's a very good case that if you think Phil Ackroyd was an early version of Fall, uh, I think there's a very good case that this uh, Danny Lane could, could talk about it if he wanted to. I had a, f a friend of mine uh, that actually spoke to Denny Lane. Is that the, what, there's a video of somebody talking to him, and Denny Lane's rather nervous and has had a few drinks, and he just does make a sort of joke about it. Well, that was one video. Yeah, that's not my friend. That was a video that goes back a couple of years ago where right. he talks about the question asked uh, to Denny was, what was it like to play with Billy Shepard? And so Denny says, oh, you, know, you mean Billy Shears? And during that whole conversation – Denny never mentions Paul McCartney, which was very, very telling. And then um, a friend of mine, Walt, he volunteers at uh, concert venues. And um, Denny was playing a concert going back, I guess, uh, a few months ago, several months ago. And so uh, Walt was doing what he was doing backstage. And Denny was there, you know, packing up his guitars. And so they got into a conversation. And Walt asked Denny about Billy. Yeah. And... Uh, Make a long story short, Denny referred to him as Billy McCartney. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Denny uh, is is doing a lot uh, in his own way to uh, to disclose, and so but you know you have to you have to read between the lines because they can't come out and just say okay well yeah he's not Paul McCartney, but they're definitely dropping clues, and, and Denny over the last two or three years, the interview you, you mentioned, and then my friend Walt running into him, and then 
Walt coming on my show to talk about it. I mean, those are significant in my. They are, yeah, yeah. I think we need to consider what kind of questions we'd like to ask you that might be answerable. Uh, you pointed out you can't just expect somebody saying no, he isn't, or whatever. Right. Uh, what, what, what? Supposing you've got an opportunity to talk with one of these people, what, what is it that you would like them to say? Uh, and and try to think of something me- meaningful. Um, that, uh, uh, for example, we mentioned uh, uh, Jane, Jane Asher. Right. Now, the, the journalists come up to her and they ask the worst possible question. They say, what are you talking about, Paul? Uh, and that is obviously the worst possible thing to do, uh, and, and shuts her up. But if, if, if she could be asked something a bit more oblique, for example, you didn't really go to Kenya with, with, with them in 66, did, did you? You know, that's a slightly oblique that might trigger some memory, because... Uh, Big Mal Evans and Full went off to Kenya, and did they take one of Paul's smart cars or not? Well, they come, they come clearly come back to the airport without the car, and then the story is put out that Jane Nasher is with them, uh, and uh, in in the Wing Beetle um, video, it has them uh, falls at some clinic in Nairobi, having some you know mind control reprogramming going on, uh, that, uh, whether or not that happened. But uh, uh, that's the kind of slightly oblique question that I, I feel that you, you might possibly be able to get an answer or uh, uh, j- just uh, ask them something to trigger a memories without, without touching on the central question, which will, which the program not to be able to answer. Right. You know, uh, and we've got various characters around, like, for example, this Mike McGear fella who actually does tours around England talking about his family, his alleged family. Um, uh, and and, and uh, uh, again, him and Full pretending to be brothers together is that most unlikely combination you, you ever see. Um, so so uh, if you can imagine meeting any of these people uh, to, to ask, ask some sort of question, uh, I mean, if, if I could meet Full, just suppose I could meet Full for a minute, right? I, I, I'd say... Hey, hey, listen, you had John and Arlene Crawford as your great grandparents, and, and they have a daughter, Helen, who's your grandmother. Uh, and then, uh, he is then named William Wallace Shepherd to, um, and Wallace being his father's name. So, so that is almost enough to identify a family tree, okay? Uh, and could we get a bit more detail? So Helen, who did Helen, her grandmother, who, who did Helen marry? Or would he just put it out a bit like that? Uh, I, I think that, that is what I, I might, I might ask him, uh, just to get this family tree, which is almost named. Yeah. It's got John and Arlene Crawford as great grandparents and Helen as a grandmother. Uh, I mean, somebody doing Scottish ancestry might be able to find that, you know. Um, he definitely says his father's name is Wallace. Um, so, I mean, he, he might just come out with a bit more on that, uh, possibly, you know. Yeah, the problem with many people, well, actually almost all of the people that ask questions to people within the Beatles circle is they all believe the false narrative. So this is why they can never ask the right questions, because they're, they're asking questions that fall into the, uh, the false history and the myth. That's the issue. Nick, another question before we uh, we wrap up here that I wanted to get your view on. Do you find, based upon you doing this work, now I know that you've, you've done some lectures and presentations with uh, one with my good friend Mark Devlin. Oh, yes, right, yeah. Yep, and I put that post up on my blog. Are people receptive to the conspiracy, or uh, do you find that people still think you're a nut job for talking about it? Well, the nice thing about this conspiracy is that it amuses people. It doesn't have the awful dark fear that, most conspiracy stuff has. Uh, so it does amuse people, uh, and it's nice talking about it uh, as something that people will kind of laugh about and people will quite like talking about. They don't particularly want any details, though. I mean, I'm baffled by the way the main experts seem to be American, like, you know, <laughs> you know yourself and uh, various people. There's me and then there's Mark Devlin in this country. And... Um, I mean, hard to think of anyone else. And, and, you know, this is where it all happened. And why isn't there more interest? So I, I'm, I'm very, 
I'm totally baffled by this. Um, that uh, uh, people want to enjoy the Beatles songs, but don't go into it. I, I would say the tremendous transformation we've been we looked at is a source of the creativity of the Beatles. A whole lot of Beatles songs have meaning from from what happened. Um, and if I, if I may just quote one, this is the question: what, what you could ask these guys, you know? And uh, the transform that Paul went through might have blotted out a whole lot of memory of his past history uh, as he switched into this new identity. Um, uh, this is Band on the Run, about how called fell into about fell, fell into the sun. Well, the rain exploded with a mighty crash as we fell into the sun, and the first one said to the second one there, "I hope you're having fun." Now, that's a stupendous image of kind of water and fire. The, the, the rain is, that's the rain bearing, rain coming down at Fall's last car drive into oblivion. Uh, and then the transform is the two of them falling into the sun together, you, you know. Um, uh, so, so that is what he personally experienced. And then these, the, the operating instructions he was given are expressed in the song Blackbird, right? Um, uh, 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 what he was told to do, Blackbird singing in the dead of night, Take these broken wings and learn to fly. Okay? That's right. All, all your life you were only waiting for this moment to arise. So is nobody until this moment came. Like the scene the other night, take these sunken eyes and learn to see. So there's a dead body there and he's got to somehow resuscitate it all your life. Uh, blackbird, blackbird fly into the light of the dark black night. Fly, blackbird fly into the light of the dark black night. So, so that's this scary darkness he flies into for the transformation. Uh, so that's kind of I- I- ex- expressing something that he went through, whereby he kind of changed and could tune into being uh, full. Um, so, uh, like you, I- I- I'm mystified. Here, here we are, the anniversary of Paul's Paul's uh, birthday, 18th of June. That that, that, uh, that there aren't more people. Who, who want to hear this story and and uh, and, and look into it? Yeah, I, I, I find that quite. I must. Say, I find it quite baffling. Yeah, uh, and I'm hoping that um, this um, sensational research you've been doing, uh, which is really the most astonishing thing of all, this guy with six toes. Um, I'm hoping that will get people going a bit more because it's not complicated or philosophical. It's just a picture of a guy with six toes. Well, I became aware of it, Nick, because I did an interview with Tina Foster, and, and Tina mentioned it because she was clued in on it. And then when I went to go look at it, I found that going back to some forums, going back a decade ago or so, there were mentions. But these forums are all basically gone these days. You know, they've been. Oh right, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean they're yeah. not they're not active. Yeah. So there was discussion about it, but there was no broadcasting of it. There was no broad awareness of to look at a guy with with six toes. And it wasn't until Tina mentioned it to me that, I mean, I wrote it down during the show and I thought, well, well, let me take a look at this, you know? So, and when I did, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And that's what led me to put the video out. Right. So, uh, but it is, it is a, a very, very key proof point because it clearly shows that there is a different person playing the role. Yeah. It shows we've got more than one fall. Is that what it shows? Exactly. Yeah. And you've got really good pictures of six different, six or eight different uh, he- headshots of, of people yes. claiming to be Paul. Uh, it makes us realise all the different replacements that they've, they've been given us. So we're part of a sort of experiment. They keep giving us different pictures of, of Paul, and will we accept it? Yeah, the, the experiment is you know, it's blending, and that blending conditions us to just accept the fact that when they say that he's Paul McCartney, we nod our heads and say he's Paul McCartney. Or they put him in the context of being Paul McCartney as a Beatle and so on. You know, we see the other Beatles, John, George, and Ringo, and we see the other guy, and we assume that that's Paul McCartney. We don't ask any more questions. Yeah. By the way, do you think that um, Lennon was, uh, are there any doubles with Lennon? Do you think there are sufficient changes in his face or not? Yeah, yeah. I, I did a uh, a collage, and I'll try to get that out. I did it a while ago, and I, and I showed my wife, and I said, look, take a look at this. I said, I pulled some, you know, pictures of Lennon off the, off the internet and I lined them up. It's the same way as the other one, you know, four on top, four on the bottom. And she says, Mike, at least two of them are not the same person. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I should, I should tell everybody that my wife is a professional artist. 
Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. she understands perspective. She understands the human form. Yeah. And so, and I said, okay, well, that's exactly what I thought. Yeah. The one that I find most interesting, Nick, as far as Lennon goes, is there were pictures released in uh, during the double fantasy period, right, right before John died, right. of a version of John Lennon that I, even back in, the, in 1980, when those pictures were released, I thought, that doesn't look like him at all. He looked older. His face, the nose, even though it was pinched, yeah. was much different. It was longer, and it was kind of very weird looking, you know? Yeah. And do you think the other guy sung? Or do you think there's only one singer? Because I mean, they always want to have other people on the covers, don't they? Part of their experiments. It's possible they had other singers, you know? I People argue with me on that sometimes, and I say, look, have you ever gone to see a Beatles tribute band, like a really good Beatles tribute band? Yeah. And they'll say, well, no. I say, okay. Go to one. Go see the band Rain as an example. It's R A I N for those that are not familiar with the band Rain. Listen to them sing. Yeah. The singing is uncanny. I mean, it's not hitting the mark all the time, but on some songs, Nick, you can't discern between what you're hearing on stage and what you remember hearing on the albums. In other words, it's so close that you would think to yourself, if you close your eyes, you're listening to that particular Beatles singing. So I, I think the whole thing with voice and replicating, you know, the, the voice and impersonating it, mm -hmm. it's, it's very possible. And quite honestly, I don't think a lot of people have spent a lot of time looking into the doubles and the lookalikes of Lennon. So he gets a free pass, right? Yeah. Yeah, he does. But, um, Fall is the one, obviously, there are all sorts of replacements of him. I don't know if you've got the cover of, uh, that, that Butcher's cover. Yeah. I have uh, that. Yeah. All yeah, oh, right. Now, I felt that all four of those were were very close to doubles and that the real Beatles weren't actually there. Uh, and I, look, I read interviews in, in music magazines by the Beatles, or George and Paul, around the time that photogra photo session was taken. And it didn't sound the slightest bit as if they were being posing with bits of carcass and dead dolls and stuff. Um, so my impression was that that was... A set up with, uh, with, with 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 doubles could, could, could be yeah yeah uh, but but let's just yeah let's just clarify this is that that you had doubles for Paul while he was alive yes uh, and and Epstein said this it's obvious reason if if, if you if your musician gets ill before a concert you just quickly put in a replacement uh, but the doubles that, that they don't sing generally speaking you know, or, or or they're not they're not a replacement. They may make the lead singer aware that he can be replaced. There may be a sort of watch out. You're not as replaceable as you may think. Uh, irreplaceable as you may think. Um, but uh, they are just doubles or, or, or stand-ins. Uh, and it's a totally different thing from actually replacing somebody. Uh, which So I would generally say there was only one Paul singing before 66. And that is what Mark was doubt doubting, right? Mark Devlin, in the second volume of Musical Truth, in both the volumes he's got a chapter on this issue, uh, and the second volume, he's much more looking at the idea of multiple characters being around. And that there were possibly two Pauls right from the start, and he's wondering whether Fall was in there right from the start, you know? Well, yeah, for all the new memoirs says that uh, Billy was around going back to the 1962 time period when he was playing with the uh, the diplomats and they were uh, a double bill with the Beatles and they actually shared the same uh, dressing room backstage. And that uh, it was actually Denny Lane that introduced uh, Billy to uh, biological Paul McCartney early on. So the point I'm making is, is that uh, not that Billy was sitting in with the Beatles, but that, you know, Billy and the Beatles knew each other. Now, how well they knew each other, I don't know. But the thing was, they ran in the same circles. Yeah, yeah. You see? Like a lot of the other bands, like the Rolling Stones and so on. I do believe that there were doubles and lookalikes from the very beginning. Uh, like you said, Nick, for obvious reasons. I mean, you know, they're going to need uh, doubles and lookalikes for public consumption. Yeah. You know, photo ops and and stuff like that at at the very. But it's just astonishing how many there are of them. I mean, I think, I think you brought them out brought out very well with your two collections of photos, or the different forms they've got, and it does show a massive. It looks rather like a psychological operation. I mean, if you've got, if you've got one replacement, 
that is just normal music business, what you expect. But you've got a whole load of them. Right. It looks like some complicated operation to explore the, uh, some sort of control uh, uh, over us. That, uh, if Paul is kind of archetypal, lovable pop, pop singer, uh, that th- they wanted to look at various different options they've got for this. Yeah. Well, what I'll do, Nick, is, uh, I will, uh, dig up the collage I did of Lennon and I'll, I'll insert it in this show so people could take a look at it and they can see for themselves if they see, you know, the same guy or maybe there's one or two in that mix that are not the same guy. So, uh, I'll let the, the audience decide. So, Nick, before we wrap up, this has been a great conversation. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about or anything else you wanted to, uh, to let the audience know? Well, I'm interested. The, 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 the plastic maca lady, uh, Heather, sorry, what was her name? Uh, Tina Foster. Tina, yeah, she, she's, she's really good on all this stuff. So, we're, we're giving her credit for first discovering the, uh, the six toes story. Um, she has got a book just come out. Now, I haven't read it, but, uh, yes, she, she, she's done some, some work on the subject. I think she's one of the, you know, original uh, experts on this subject. She's, she's really tuned into it very well. Yeah, Tina's very good, and she's done excellent research. So, uh, yeah, so I had her come on the show to talk about this. Because, as I mentioned in one quick video, I said, read all the books on this, because uh, the, the more you read, uh, the more you're going to, to know. I think we're wondering uh, how this thing can move forward. There's a whole lot of question marks. I mean, if we could get any DNA sampling, I mean, you, you, you explain why it probably wouldn't happen. That would be very, very obvious. Otherwise, one keeps hoping that there are some old musicians around who will want to tell some story before they pass away. Um, but as so many groups knew this was happening. Well, it won't be Ringo. He just got knighted a little while ago. <laughs> no, 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 right, right. He, he really knows to keep quiet. He only ever said one thing. He said, I'm the last remaining Beatle. Yeah. Um, and, and that's all he's going to say. He's carefully measured. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's all he's going to come out with, I suspect. Yeah. But, and also during the, uh, the Beatles induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, George said we all loved past tense, Paul. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I put that video out too. And I still get people arguing with me. I don't hear the word. I don't hear loved. I don't hear past tense. I'm like, you're not listening close enough. You know? Yeah, it says we all loved Paul and we all loved John. Right, exactly. Uh, and, and this is all that there are left of us. Uh, I, I mean, Paul was taking a very snooty attitude. He refused to turn up with them. Yep, he didn't show uh, up. Uh, uh, that, perhaps that was wise, because on a platform like that, they see that he's taller. Uh, you know, so in a way, he couldn't turn up with them. It was just those two. So anything else, Nick? Do you have any websites or any other books that you would like our audience to be aware of that uh, you've published? Well, no, none terribly relevant. I, I, I've just done one about about 9-11. I'm, I'm just trying to do, who did 9-11? And that, that might be banned by Amazon, I'm not sure. But uh, th- that's that's been published. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I've sort of done various conspiracy books. Uh, and, uh, and this McCartney one is, is the one kind of happy theme, I, I, I would say, that, that makes people laugh and, uh, you know, doesn't have any terrible... Doesn't have too much of a terrible meaning to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mike. Well, wonderful talking with you. You too, Nick. And I'll have the show out on uh, on Biological Paul's birthday this month. Ah, fantastic! Yeah. Huh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, Nick. It was a pleasure talking with you. All the best. All right. Bye yeah, bye. See now. You. And that concludes another Sage Aquay interview. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the description box below. And as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.